Good morning. Thank you for everybody staying in there for all of the talks as well. It's my pleasure to talk about the other side of treatment. And I am going to try and reemphasize the fact that I think something I repeat over and over in my office is more is not always better. And so I'm going to put something out there to say sometimes watching is actually a good thing and is an active treatment. So side effects of BRAF and MEK inhibitors as well as immunotherapies. Um, and I think Dr. Lau and I have the same excitement over the melanoma timeline. And this is, again, just in a little bit of a different schematic, but for quite some time we had a couple agents for more advanced disease, both the chemotherapy that was already talked about, DTIC or decarbazine, same thing, as well as high dose interleukin-2. And we now are fortunate to have several options, iplimumab and vemurafenib approved in 2011. Dabrafenib and trametinib, both of these fall into the BRAF inhibitor category and MEK inhibitors. In 2014, dabrafenib in combination with trametinib, pembrolizumab as well as nivolumab, both of those are PD-1 inhibitors in the immunotherapy category. And then in 2015, the combination of nivolumab and ipilimumab, the telimogene or TVEC vaccine, again, intratumoral injection, falls into the immunotherapy category. And then cobimetinib, which is another MEK inhibitor approved for combination with the original vemurafenib. Something I think to appreciate is when things um, are shown to be beneficial, it's not just the medicine itself, but the dose and the schedule and whether or not it's combined with something else. So when we evaluate things, if we have something that's already FDA approved, but we want to combine it with something else or use it in a different way, that needs to be reevaluated again. It's not just assumed that it will be beneficial. So I want to talk about the fact that melanoma is a varied illness. This can start in a variety of different parts of the body, obviously the skin, but there's a wide variety in locations in the skin. It can spread to different parts of the body, and so while many cancers will follow maybe more typical patterns, I usually say that there is no pattern for melanoma. It does not have to go to lymph nodes before it goes somewhere else. Some people may have brain involvement, some people may not. Some people will have extensive bone involvement, some people will not. And there's obviously differences in the genetic makeup of melanomas. BRAF mutations are one of the most common ones we know about, but we're still learning all of the differences. And melanoma is by definition not one, not one size fits all. I want to make a similar uh, conclusion about the patients. We talk about the host or the, the person that's affected by the cancer, and this isn't just melanoma, but there's many different people out there. There are men and women, there are young and old, there are people who are very healthy, and then there's people who maybe are not so healthy and have other unique medical problems that then are going to be factored in or should be factored in in what we should do. People have different immune systems, and so then the most important thing is we can talk about side effects, but side effects are very hard to predict. Side effects, by definition, are not always bad, so you can have milder ones as well as more severe ones. And the hard part is, until we actually get something into a patient, we don't really know exactly how it's going to behave, and we get surprised. And so I tend to have my policy of prepare for the worst, educate as much as possible so that you guys don't sit at home and not tell us when something is going wrong. Treatment options are going to fall into big categories, and again, this is more advanced melanoma we're going to be talking about. Immunotherapies, in general, are medicines that try and help re-educate or adjust someone's immune system to fight against the cancer, and in particular, we're going to talk about melanoma. Ipilimumab, pembrolizumab, nivolumab, high-dose IL-2, vaccines, and obviously others coming down the line. Molecular or targeted therapies are an idea that if you think about the cells trying to communicate to each other, we talk about these signaling pathways, and I try and imagine a telephone line between these cells, and we're trying to clamp the line. I say clamp rather than cut because, unfortunately, many times the cancer starts to try and figure out how to get around the medicine we're giving as soon as we put it into the body. And so that's something else that when we talk about whether to treat or not to treat, we think about the long-term effect is once we've put a medicine into somebody, that changes them to some degree agree permanently. Um, these target different signaling pathways, and we're going to focus just on what we call the MAP kinase pathway, which involves both BRAF and MEK. And the medicines we're going to be talking about are vemurafenib, cobimetinib, dabrafenib, and trametinib. And then lastly, chemotherapy. 
I'm a believer that I like to have all my tools, so while chemotherapy often has a less chance of helping in the setting of melanoma, I never throw them out, and in some people we can get some responses. And these are the more traditional ones that are trying to kill cells that are rapidly dividing. And decarbazine, temozolomide, carboplatin, paclitaxel, obviously there's a long list. I talk about these mechanisms of action of how these medicines work, because if you understand the way the medicines work, you can understand how we get the side effects, or what we, I consider collateral damage. So immunotherapies, and we're going to focus mainly on checkpoint inhibitors. There's ipilimumab. The brand name is Yervoy, and this is what we call an anti-CTLA-4, and this is a monoclonal antibody. The PD-1 inhibitors currently FDA approved for the treatment of melanoma are nivolumab and pembrolizumab, or Opdivo and Keytruda. And these can be given as single medicines, as well as in combination. I did not include percentages, but we're going to talk about some of them out loud. When we start talking about side effects, it's not just a laundry list of things that can happen, but the chances of them happening and the severity. When we talk about side effects, we try and say, well, what is the problem? And how severe is it? And we tend to use a grading system, one through five, where one to two is less severe, three to four is more severe, possibly bad enough to require hospitalization, and five, unfortunately, is fatal. And so all of these, it's hard to summarize some of that when you just see a list of different side effects. These are all antibodies, and so if you think about the immune system, we often use the analogy of a car with gas pedals and brakes. We want the immune system to protect us from foreign invaders. Most people think about infections, but cancer is by definition a foreign invader. And the hard part is that cancer hijacks normal parts of the body to hide itself or protect itself from your immune system. So when Dr. Lau was talking about how the immune system has to recognize something and then get revved up, that's one of the difficulties is that there are similar markers on normal parts of your body and cancer cells. And so that's where some of that, if the immune system recognizes some of those, that's some of the collateral damage, but that's also why it's so hard for the immune system to find some of these cancers. Once again, these are given in the vein, typically on an every two or three week basis, depending on what we're choosing. And these benefits, again, are the possibility of long-lasting benefits. If we have adjusted your immune cells and we even stop the treatment, the hope is that your immune system is then, at least if not permanently fixed, maybe long-term will be re-educated so that it can continue to do the work even if we stop giving you the medications. Side effects. So the majority of side effects with respect to these immunotherapies is if we stimulate your immune cells and then these immune cells attack normal parts of your body by accident or, again, collateral damage. These can be similar to autoimmune conditions, if people have heard about that. So autoimmune conditions is when the immune system, by definition, is already kind of misfiring against normal parts of the body by accident. But they're not exactly the same. I, the main word I use when we talk about these is unpredictable. We can't tell who's going to get them, when they're going to happen. They can happen even after we stop active treatment, and so that's something we caution our patients to be aware of even if we stop the dosing. If the immune system is still keeping the cancer under control, I say the immune system could still go a little haywire and attack a normal part of you by accident. And it's very difficult to predict how severe. Some people have very mild side effects. However, some people are going to have pretty impressive ones, and sometimes not just one part of the body affected, but multiple. When we do the medicines together, the Ipinevo regimen that Dr. Lau was talking about, the chances are about threefold of a more severe toxicity than if we did some of the medicines by themselves. And so that has to factor into the decision making as well. Typically, these don't wear off. These are all required treatment with steroids, typically things like prednisone, sometimes the IV equivalent of, of prednisone. And we typically do not cut the steroids down over anything faster than a month. And unfortunately, sometimes it takes months to get the steroids down because we think we can't just give a short burst. If we don't go slowly, the problem will keep bounding back up again. Occasionally, we have what we call steroid refractory side effects, and these can be um, worrisome, where that sometimes we need to use additional medicines to help try and suppress the immune system to allow it to calm down enough to then wean the steroids off. These side effects can get worse if they aren't diagnosed and treated promptly, and so this is where I say the most important thing all of the patients can do is pay attention to what's going on with their body and all those little details that don't sound very exciting, and my recommendations are always 
Call early, call often, even if you're not sure if it's a problem. The most common toxicities, and we affectionately call these the itises, because itis means inflammation of. And I'm going to break these down based on the organs of the body that are affected. Fatigue is a very common side effect for the immunotherapies. Skin can be affected like a dermatitis, so itching and rash. Sometimes these are very mild rashes. Rarely we can have life-threatening rashes. Vitiligo is the loss of skin pigment. So this is one of those collateral damages. The normal melanocytes in your body form the pigment. And so we think it's actually a good thing when you start seeing people who have had these patchy depigmentation areas on their skin and sometimes in their hair because that's a sign that the immune system is recognizing something that's a melanocyte and bad melanocytes are by definition melanoma. Oops, went too fast. Bowels or intestines or enteritis. Colitis is an inflammation of the large intestine. And so I tend to use the words change in bowel habits. Everybody means different things by diarrhea, but if your bowels are normally very regular at one a day and they start changing, we want to know that, even if it doesn't seem very exciting. Abdominal cramping, bloating, abdominal pain is a concern. Obviously, any bleeding would be very concerning. Typically, the large intestine can be affected, and very rarely people can have holes or perforations in their intestine, and obviously that's an urgent issue and often requires surgical intervention. Less commonly, the upper intestines, like the stomach or the small intestine, can be affected, so symptoms like nausea and vomiting could happen. The liver or hepatitis, this is not a virus like you hear about hepatitis B or C, but the immune system attacking the liver. This is typically not something people feel symptoms of, however rarely they can develop jaundice or turning yellow. This is usually something we see on blood work. So with every patient who comes in for treatments, blood work prior to moving on to the next dose is a standard policy. Endocrine glands can be affected. So the thyroid can get over or underactive. The pituitary gland, hypophysitis is inflammation of that, can be inflamed and or underactive. We can have underactive adrenal glands, which make adrenaline, and then underactive pancreas, which then can lead to insulin requiring diabetes. That in particular is fairly uncommon, but the pituitary and for sure the thyroid is not uncommonly affected by these, and that's something we monitor. The lungs or pneumonitis, if you have a cough that's nagging and not quite going away or shortness of breath, that could be a concern. The eyes can be affected, uveitis as well as other parts of the eye can be inflamed, and so dry, itchy, or red eyes, or obviously floaters or vision changes, those are important to convey to your doctor. Kidneys can be affected, or nephritis. Often this is detected on blood work, but sometimes people can develop swelling. Less common side effects, infusion reactions, so as the antibody is actually going in the vein, people can feel unwell. The nerves can be affected as well as the brain, and so these are some of the very rare but scary side effects that we have to make sure people are aware of. New numbness and tingling, weakness of an arm or a leg or the whole body, and severe weakness. Headaches, seizures, difficulty moving, confusion, and coma is the most severe form. Muscles and joints can be affected, so this can be inflammation of muscles, arthritis, sore muscles, difficulty moving. Another scary one, the heart can be affected. So the heart it muscle itself can get inflamed. We call that a myositis. And these have often, unfortunately, led to death for patients because the electrical system of the heart stops working because the entire heart is inflamed. And then blood cells can be affected. Platelets, red blood cells, white blood cells. Again, all of these are in the less common range. And then the more we do these immunotherapies, the more I say, and then any other part of the body could potentially be affected. And we don't necessarily know that. So when in doubt, you share anything you possibly think with your doctor. Urgent evaluations, these are the absolutes that people need to be aware of. If you have severe diarrhea, you're not keeping things down, abdominal pain and bleeding, you need to seek medical attention immediately. Eyes can be an urgent issue as well. Skin, a blister on the skin is something that we consider very concerning. There are rare skin rashes where people can have blistering and sloughing of their entire skin, and these can be life-threatening, and that's important to be aware of. The nerves and the brain tend to be in the high-risk category as well to seek urgent medical attention. 
Endocrine items can, if somebody has no insulin in their body, that can lead to diabetic comas. The pituitary or the adrenal gland, everybody's body needs adrenaline to function normally, and so these can be life-threatening as well. And if the thyroid gets too overactive, that can put quite a tax on the heart. Heart and lungs, so any shortness of breath, chest pain, palpitations, severe fatigue are urgent matters. And then obviously jaundice is an urgent matter. I want to talk a little bit about steroid side effects. We are now using quite a bit of steroids for managing most of these issues. And so obviously side effects come from that as well. And this is not, these are all not exhaustive lists of all of these things. Muscle weakness can happen, skin fragility or bruising, the change in the way your body uh, distributes the fat and muscle. Um, and so you have a characteristic appearance sometimes to people's faces as they, as they have been on steroids for a long period of time. Diabetes can happen. Infections is one of the things we worry about quite a bit. Anxiety and irritability and other psychiatric issues for some people, as well as keeping them awake. We can have ulcerations or gastritis, weight gain, underactive adrenal gland. This is doing some of the job of the adrenal gland, so that's part of the reason we need to taper things off, too, is we need to allow somebody's adrenal gland to then pick up the work that it hasn't been doing. Longer-term risks are cataracts, osteoporosis, and bone fractures, and then obviously others. Some unique items, and I think we need to emphasize this. I tend to think about our treatment of patients as a marathon, not a sprint. Many people want to push, 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 push until we can't handle anymore. Sometimes it's actually better to say, let's maybe take a break or let your body tell us what it needs and then we can keep going. And so remember, melanoma can stay under control even if we need to take temporary holds or stop treatment or treat people with steroids. The toxicities can rebound after steroid treatment and even during it, during the taper. And so we're going to be keeping eyes on people and making sure that you pay attention that the symptoms don't start coming back. New toxicity, so if you're getting treated for a bowel problem and you've been on steroids and we start tapering every now and then, we have other things show up as we're tapering for one problem. And so your doctor is going to be alert to that possibility. And I think one controversy that is ongoing is that we don't know exactly the right answer for the safety of these in people who already have pre-existing autoimmune conditions or their immune system is compromised from a transplant or from HIV or other issues. And so that ups the ante. And I would say we kind of say concern for increased toxicity risk and proceed with caution and have a really good conversation with your treating physician about that. I'm going to switch gears to molecularly targeted therapies and, again, focusing on the BRAF and MEK inhibitors. And so this is the signaling pathway we were talking about. Uh, the two main groups that we're going to be discussing, but there are others on the horizon, are vemurafenib, which is a BRAF inhibitor, in combination or alone uh, with cobimetinib, a MEK inhibitor. Dibrafenib is another BRAF inhibitor, and trametinib is the MEK inhibitor that can be paired with that. These are one or two sets of pills taken by mouth continuously for the most part, except one has a planned break in there periodically. And they would be continued as long as they're controlling the cancer. Trametinib can be used alone in some circumstances. And side effects are typically managed with drug holding or dose reducing. So this is quite a list for you to pay attention to. I tried to break it up with some animation. We're going to do BRAF drugs first, then MEK inhibitors, and then we're going to talk a little bit about when we combine them together. BRAF inhibitors, fatigue, fevers and chills, and rigors. It's really critical to have a working thermometer in your house. Sometimes the fevers can be pretty impressive to 102, 103, and 104. Rashes and skin changes are quite common, sometimes mild rashes, sometimes more significant ones. The hands and the feet on the palms and the soles can be affected with soreness. Those are pretty important things to convey promptly to your doctor. Sun sensitivity, not just that we don't want you going out in the sun, but that you can burn and burn easily, sometimes very quickly within a few minutes. Skin tumors, and Dr. Harms spoke about this a little earlier, so we can have benign growths like inflamed seborrheic keratoses, but we can also have skin cancers develop, including squamous cells, basal cells, as well as new melanomas. And so paying attention to your skin is very important. Hair change, texture, and color can sometimes happen with these medications. 
joint aches and pains where it often is kind of something that moves around. One joint hurts for a few days and then it moves to another. As long as we use the word tolerable many times. If you can live with it and it goes away and you're still doing your daily activities, then we can live with that. But if it's so severe that it's interfering with your life, that's not so okay. And sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between when something is tolerable or not. Changes in blood counts can happen less commonly. Changes in blood chemicals like electrolytes. We can have electrical changes to the heart, so often your physician may be following an EKG on you when you come to the office. Eye problems, including inflammation of the eye, so floaters or vision changes would be important to pay attention to. Some people have taste change or decreased appetite. Liver and kidney problems and then bleeding and blood clot problems are possible but a bit less common. And then rare, there can be other secondary cancers that develop on BRAF inhibitors, including pancreas, head and neck, intestinal cancers, brain. These are rare but have been reported. Hypersensitivity reactions, meaning kind of a, almost like an allergic reaction. Your body overreacts to it. And this is often in the setting of a rash where then the liver or the kidney can be affected. And then rare nerve problems. MEK inhibitors have some similarities, fatigue, but a little bit more gastrointestinal side effects, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and sometimes abdominal pain. We again can see skin changes. The rash that we see with MEK inhibitors is a bit different than what we see with uh, BRAF inhibitors when they're used independently. We can see nail changes or cracks in the tips of the finger. Changes in blood counts and swelling can happen. There's some unique eye problems as well, and again, this is important to be aware of, something called central serous retinopathy or fluid collecting in the back of the eye that tends to be reversible. There are rare occasions where people have lost the blood flow to the back of the eye, something we call retinal vein occlusion, and this is about 0.2%, but important to be aware of because occasionally can cause permanent blindness. Muscle breakdown with kidney problems, heart failure, lung inflammation or pneumonitis, case changes in appetite, and again, liver, kidney, or blood problems. When we put the two together, the risk of fevers and chills tends to go up quite a bit, and so this is not an uncommon problem we have to manage. We often have to think that, evaluate foreign infection, but many times we don't find an infection, it's the drug itself. Holding the doses and cutting down the doses is often necessary, but we typically can manage and sometimes give advice. We would prefer for you not to manage this at home on your own, but to cut with us because we need to give you advice. Increased risk of some GI side effects and increased risk of bleeding and blood clots. Interestingly, the skin side effects for both medicines as independent ones are better when we put the two together, including a lower chance of some of the skin uh, cancers. Monitoring tests for immunotherapies are going to be office visits. What you tell us is critical. So the more concrete information you can provide us really does help us understand what's going on. And then blood work. For the molecularly targeted therapies, office visits, your symptom reports again, lab work, EKGs, echocardiograms to evaluate for the heart function, the squeeze are often incorporated, and then skin exams and eye exams depending on what's going on. So here is my to-do list for the well-educated melanoma patient. Pay attention to your symptoms, new versus old, something that's been with you for 20 years, we're probably not going to make better, but if it got started getting worse, we would want to know about that. Pay attention to your skin and your bowels. These are common and frequently affected. Talk to your doctor or your doctor's office about all issues. No, no issue is too small to discuss with them. And call for problems between appointments. We do not like people saving things up, especially with oral medicines. If you're having a problem, we may need to tell you to hold it before you come in to see us. It's important to be honest. Many people are very hesitant to have their medicines taken away from them. Again, this is a marathon, not a sprint. It may be in your best interest, actually, to take a small break so that we can continue for the long haul. We want to monitor for improvement of all of these side effects. We're not just going to assume that they all get better. They can rebound, and they may need to be readdressed. Have a working thermometer. Very, very important. Lotion daily can't hurt anybody and often can minimize some of the skin side effects. Know all of your medicines. Please talk with your doctor before starting new medicines or supplements, and please talk with them about vaccinations as well. My policy in the setting of immunotherapies is I tend to minimize or avoid vaccines because I don't want to distract the immune system. Some providers may be a little less familiar with these medicines, so going to an emergency room that's not 
somebody who ends up dealing with these on a regular basis. If you are having problems, it is always important to make sure that if you're admitted to another hospital that your treating cancer doctor knows what's going on, they need to be involved with the care of your, of your side effect. Thank you.